Good afternoon, my name is Jeff Roberts. I'm a conservation educator at the Salado Wildlife Education Center that's operated by the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. We appreciate you tuning in today for today's session that's all about raptors. Also joining me today is another educator at the Salado Center, Isabella. She's gonna be helping me with some props and helping field some of your questions. And I think I know a question many of you have right now, and that is, what is a raptor? What exactly are we gonna be talking about today? Some of you might have in your mind that we're gonna be talking about dinosaurs. And it's okay if, if I were to ask you who out there thought we were gonna be talking about dinosaurs. It's okay to raise your hand at home. A lot of people associate the word raptor with dinosaurs, mostly thanks to the Jurassic Park franchise, but we're not actually going to be talking about dinosaurs today. You see the word raptor actually means to seize and carry away or to grab and carry away. Now we haven't had dinosaurs on earth for quite some time, but we still have a very special and very specific group of animals that are still grabbing things and carrying them away. In this case, what we're going to be discussing today are a very specific group of birds. So for the purposes of today's discussion, when I say raptor, what we're talking about are hawks, pick that up, hawks, falcons, eagles, and owls. Hawks, falcons, eagles, and owls. These are a very specific group of birds. Now, birds themselves are one of the most diverse groups of animals on the planet. They come in all different types of shapes, sizes, colors. They live in different habitats. They behave differently, and they eat different things. And that's kind of the key to what we're talking about today. The key to this group of animals is what they are designed to hunt and eat. They are carnivorous, which means they are catching and eating other animals. So that's what raptor means. Raptors for today's uh, purposes means the hawks, falcons, eagles, and owls. You can use the term bird of prey somewhat interchangeably. And a lot of people are probably more familiar with the term bird of prey. But even more specifically, what makes a raptor a raptor and what makes raptors different than so many other different types of birds that you're probably familiar with are their adaptations. Adaptations are things that allow animals to survive better and raptors have very specific raptorial adaptations that I want us to go through to give you a better understanding of what, what makes a raptor a raptor. So first of all, not all birds can fly, but all raptors can fly. So we're gonna go ahead and stick those wings on there. By the way, currently this would be no way to live, to have none of your adaptations that you would need for survival. But we've added wings, that's a pretty good starting point, but we're still missing some very important things. All raptors have excellent eyesight. They can see much further and much clearer than we can. And in the case of owls, they have special eyes that are, that are generally very large. The larger your eyes are, the more light that they allow to come in, and that allows you to see better in low light conditions. We know that owls are mostly nocturnal, so that means they need to have eyesight that allows them to do what they need to do, in this case, hunt in order to survive in low light conditions. In order to seize and carry away, remember what raptor means, you need to have tools that allow you to do that. Those special feet of raptors are known as talons, and Isabella actually has a model, that's exactly what a bald eagle talon would look like. So from home, you're probably getting a good look at that. Use your powers of observation when you're looking at that talon. What do you notice about it? I think probably one of the first things you would notice are the claws on there. Those are very large and they're very useful in, in for what talons are designed to do. Talons are their means of hunting and grabbing hold of their prey. So when I say that talons are strong, I want you to think about this. I said this is a bald eagle talon. This is exactly what a bald eagle talon would look like. A bald eagle with one talon can squeeze 1,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. 1,000 pounds. Now a great horned owl can squeeze about 500 pounds. A red-tailed hawk could squeeze about 300 pounds. For comparison, the average adult human, male especially, the average adult man can squeeze about 100 pounds. The average adult woman can squeeze about 60. So if a guy can squeeze only 100 pounds, a bald eagle is 10 times stronger in terms of its grip strength. See, if your life literally depends on your ability to grab hold of something, not let it get away from you, and kill it so that you can eat it, well then you need to have the tools that allow you to do that, and that's exactly what talons are for. Next up, we're looking better all the time, but we still are missing something very important, and that would be the bird's beak. Now you can tell a lot about a specific bird 
and about what it eats just by looking at its beak. Again, we're going to use our powers of observation as we look at this bald eagle's skull. I think that a lot of you, if you were to stumble upon this skull, even if you didn't know what species it belonged to, I've got a feeling that based on the look and the shape of that beak, you would have a pretty good guess as to what this bird eats. Raptor beaks are, are usually fairly large. They are curved downward. They're kind of sharp and pointy, and they are designed to do something very specific. Now, I want you to imagine that you are eating your favorite piece of meat at home. Think about a really big piece of meat, whether it's steak or a pork chop, chicken, salmon, whatever the case may be, whatever your favorite cut of meat is. How do you get that down into little bite-sized pieces? I doubt that you all pick it up off your plate and just start eating it. Some of you may be saying that that's what you do. I bet that's not actually what you do. I bet many of you use tools yourselves, like say a knife and a fork, to cut it up into little pieces. Well, raptors out in the wild, you know, they don't have access to knives and forks, but that's exactly what their beak is for. This is a very special tool that allows them to tear off bite-sized chunks of meat. Very special tool for the beak. So, we put all the pieces together, we've got the full package here. We have the ability to fly, which makes them very effective and very efficient hunters. If you can come from above, a lot of times unsuspecting prey items aren't always looking up, so that's a great way to hunt. You need to be able to see whatever it is you're trying to catch. You have talents to catch it with and to hold on to it and kill it with. And then you've got a beak that acts like a knife and a fork. This is what makes a raptor a raptor. By the way, we have some live raptors that we're gonna show you uh, today, and I think this will be a good chance, unless we have questions coming in. Do we have any questions coming in? We have in? some questions. Okay, very good. Um, we'll take a couple quick questions. Tim would like to know, what do bald eagles eat? What do bald eagles eat? So Tim, what bald eagles are using these talons for? Mostly are fish. Bald eagles belong to a group of eagles known as sea eagles, although we don't really have a lot of seas here in Kentucky, we still do have a lot of water. Bald eagles live near water, they make their living there, and although they do eat other smaller animals too, like small mammals, and even aquatic turtles, if you can believe that, mostly bald eagles are catching and eating fish. Excellent question. And then we have another eagle question as well. All right. Josh would like to know, how much does a bald eagle weigh? How much does a bald eagle weigh? Well, looks can be deceiving. Even though bald eagles are very large raptors, they don't weigh as much as people often would guess that they weigh. A bald eagle on average weighs eight to 12 pounds. Here in Kentucky, a lot of our bald eagles in the wild are weighing 10, 11, or 12 pounds. Uh, they look like they might weigh much more than that. Uh, they look like if you were to compare a mammal of, of the same size, like say if you have a dog or a cat at home that, that's roughly the size of a bald eagle, your dog or cat might weigh 20 or 30 or more pounds. It looks like a bald eagle would weigh that much. But you have to understand that birds that fly, and we said all raptors fly, they have to be built for flight. And one way that they do that is they have lots of neat adaptations and lots of neat things about them that allow them to be very lightweight. They're covered in feathers, and feathers don't weigh very much. They have a reduced number of bones than mammals of similar size would have. A lot of their bones are hollow, which saves weight. And so there are many ways that raptors and other flighted birds do uh, achieve that lightweight. So a bald eagle weighs eight to 12 pounds. Great question. We've got one more question. Okay. Lori has heard some chirping in the background and she would like to know what that's coming yes, from. Yes, some of you might have heard some, some chirping. It's not happening right this second, but we've had some chirping in the background. That is going to be our second, uh, there it was. That is going to be our second guest, our special guest. We have two special guests with us and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and go excuse myself for just one moment, and I'm gonna get our first guest that we're gonna take a look at. So I will be right back. Well, I have our first feathered guest here, our first live raptor that we're gonna take a look at. A lot of you at home are probably going, aw, right now. This is a, a very, pretty cute little raptor here. This is obviously, I think every one of you at home know that this is an owl. I said that we do have owls in Kentucky. We actually have four species of owl. 
that live in Kentucky year round. They don't ever leave, they don't migrate, they stay here all year round. This is the smallest of the four, and believe it or not, she is full grown. She is not a baby owl. This is as big as she's ever gonna get. This is a very common species of owl that we have in Kentucky called an Eastern Screech Owl. Eastern Screech Owl is what this is. Uh, they are still impressive little predators. We said that all raptors are catching and eating other animals. And what a screech owl mostly is catching and eating are large nighttime flying insects like moths, katydids, cicadas, things like that, and then small rodents. That is mostly what eastern screech owls are eating. I want to give you a little bit of the backstory on this specific owl and why she lives here at the Salado Wildlife Center with us. This owl, and actually all of the raptors that we have at Salado, are what we call permanently non-releasable due to injury, which means that they were wild at one point in time, but they've all suffered an injury that makes it to where they would just simply not be able to survive on their own out in the wild. She was actually hit by a car, which is an unfortunate thing that does happen to a lot of raptors, and you can't tell by looking at her, but she actually has an eye injury that makes it to where she just cannot see well enough to catch food. If you're a raptor, we talked about how important the eyesight is, if you're a raptor and you can only see well out of one eye, that means that you don't have good depth perception, and that's your ability to judge distance. If you are hunting other animals and those animals are moving very quickly, like bugs would be doing and small rodents would be doing, well then you have to be able to judge distance in order to catch those things, and she's just not able to do that anymore, so that's why she lives here at the Salados Wildlife Center with us. Eastern screech owls are cavity nesters, so they're gonna they're gonna find a hollowed out part of a, of a uh, tree or a natural cavity, and that's where they're gonna hang out when the weather's no good, that's where they're gonna raise their young. And they are themselves, their coloration, it's actually pretty neat. They can come in three different color phases. What you're looking at here is grayish brown, they can also be reddish brown, and they can also be just kind of a solid brown color. But no matter what color they happen to be, regardless of color phase, they blend in perfectly with, you guessed it, trees. They spend a lot of time in trees, whether they're hanging out and hiding from things that might wanna eat them, because by the way, if this is as small as you are, and this is as big as you're ever gonna get, even though you are a predator if you're a screech owl, you are still part of the food chain. Other larger owls, like a great horned owl, for example, would absolutely make a meal out of an eastern screech owl if they could catch it. So, that also goes into the decision on whether a raptor is, is deemed releasable or non-releasable. It's more than just about catching food for itself, because that's, that's very important, obviously, but it's also about can this animal defend itself against things that might want to try to eat it? So that is her story. That's why she lives here with us. Now, one question I get asked a lot, and I bet it's on there if we looked, is can an owl turn their head all the way around? Well. Yeah, if I move my hand here, you can see that she's able to kind of fixate her head and keep looking where she wants to look. But lots of people think that an owl can actually turn their head all the way around. Well, in geometry class, you will learn or you've learned that a full circle is 360 degrees. A screech owl, and actually most birds, including most of the other raptors for that matter, can actually turn their heads 270 degrees. So three quarters of the way all the way around, but not all the way around. They simply are unable to do that, but they can come very close. They can turn their head much further than we can. I have an exercise I want everyone at home to do right now. Look straight ahead and without moving your head, so hold on to your head if you need to. Without moving your head, everybody look up and look down and look to your left and look to your right. Can everybody do that at home? I bet you can do that at home. That's because we and lots of other animals have muscles that allow us to move our eyes. So while owls can do something we can't do because we can't turn our heads 270 degrees, some of you probably tried at home already, we are simply unable to do that, but we can move our eyes. You have to understand that she cannot actually move her eyes. Owl eyes are so large that they take up so much space that there's no room left for eye muscles. So unlike us, her eyes are stuck in place and in order to see everything that she needs to see, she has to have a much greater range of motion on how she can turn her head. Most birds, including the raptors, have 14 bones in their neck that allow for this range of motion. We only have seven. So we can't turn our heads like they can, but we can move our eyeballs unlike they can. Do we have any other questions, Isabella? We do Come have in? some questions okay. about screech owls. Evan would like to know, what do they sound like? Do they screech? Is uh, that how they an, get their name? That is an excellent question. I'm glad you asked that. A lot of birds have very good names, like the red-tailed hawk, for example. That's a great name because it has a red tail or a reddish-brown tail. In the case of the eastern screech owl, however, in my opinion, 
They don't have a very good name because they don't actually screech. They make a high-pitched, it's a wavering whistle noise. I'm not good at making it. I'm not even going to attempt to. But the good thing about uh, you folks at home is you can just Google Eastern Screech Owl and you can listen to exactly what they sound like. It does not sound like a screech in my opinion. So if it, not that they asked me when they named the Eastern Screech Owl, but in my opinion, it's not a great name because it's not accurate. But I'm very glad you asked that question. Very good question. One more, Nikki would like to know, how much do screech owls weigh? How much do screech owls weigh? So we said that birds are built to be lightweight, and so this little bird here weighs about a quarter of a pound, less than a pound. So about a quarter of a pound is what she would weigh. Very good question. That's it All for right. now. Oh, that's it for now. Well, I think, if we don't have any more questions coming in about screech owls, what I'm gonna do is, you're about to find out what that chirping and what that squeaking noise is. So I am gonna trade out my feathered friend here so give me just one quick moment. Well, we have swapped out for our next guest. This is the culprit behind all of that chirping and chattering noises that you've been hearing. I want everybody to get a very good look at this. This is a beautiful little bird. Just like the screech owl, this is not a baby. This is full grown. So we're kind of doing our pint-sized predator edition of our raptor discussion today. This is a small falcon. Remember we said that, that uh, the raptors that we have, falcons are included. This is a type of falcon. A lot of people, when they see her, their first guess is a peregrine falcon. Well, it's a good guess. We do have peregrine falcons in Kentucky, but they would be much larger than this. They would be about the size of a crow. Peregrine falcons are actually not that common in Kentucky, although we do have them. This, on the other hand, is pretty common in the state of Kentucky. This is called an American kestrel, and this is the smallest and most abundant falcon species in all of North America. I'll give you some backstory on her, just like that screech owl. She has been injured in such a way that would prevent her from surviving in the wild. And she's gonna rouse for you. That is a good sign. Anytime you have a captive raptor that does that, that shows that they are comfortable. So that's a compliment to all of us in this room right now. So the uh, American kestrel, this American kestrel was found on the ground. Uh, people saw her, she wasn't flying away. They immediately knew something was wrong. And so they did what the law requires you to do if you encounter an injured or orphaned wild animal. They collected her up, put her in a shoebox, and they took her to a wildlife rehabilitator, where with a veterinarian, they actually went in and did surgery. If you can believe that this little kestrel has had surgery, she has, they were able to repair the wing, and their surgery was successful. They were able to successfully repair the wing and restore her ability to fly. However, they did not feel that she was able to fly well enough to kind of, like we were talking about with the screech owl, to catch food for herself or to protect herself against predators that might want to eat her. So kestrels are, um, the neat thing is, and we, we might get this question, I'm kind of surprised we haven't got it already, but I'm going to give you a question I get oftentimes when we discuss kestrels, because it's a really neat, unique thing about kestrels. You got an itch there? One common question we get asked is, how can you tell the difference between a male and a female? How do you tell the difference between a boy raptor and a girl raptor? Well, with most raptors, like bald eagles, red-tailed hawks, great horned owls, most of them are colored identically, and there's really no way to tell the difference. If you had two sitting next to one another on a branch, the one that's bigger is gonna be the female, because with raptors, females are larger. But the really neat thing about kestrels is they are actually colored differently with males and females. You've heard me referring to her as a she. We know that because of how she's colored. Now, if you look at the really pretty bluish gray coloration on her head, everybody get a good look at that? Well, males are gonna have that on their wings. So you could say that male kestrels are just a little bit more colorful than female kestrels. Although the females are very pretty uh, the way that they are colored, we think about males being colored 
more brightly colored when we think about songbirds. Like for example, the male cardinal is much more brightly colored than the female. That is kind of the case with kestrels. So if you are out in the wild, by the way, where can I see a kestrel? If you feel like you've never seen a kestrel in the wild, or maybe you have, but you're not sure, or just you love kestrels and you want to see more of them, you need to understand the type of habitat that kestrels prefer. They are a grassland species, which means they prefer open territory with some wood lots and wood edges nearby. They are also cavity nesters, just like the screech owl. So that's the same place that they are going to nest and live is in a hollowed out part of an old tree. So they do need some trees around. But the, uh, the areas that they need for hunting are going to be, she's preening now, she's getting her feathers all uh, arranged for you very nicely. The, uh, the uh, areas that you're going to find kestrels are going to be fields and meadows, open agricultural land. And most of the kestrels I see in the wild are perched on utility poles and power lines. That gives them an excellent vantage point to look for their favorite food. And the menu of an American kestrel is very similar to the menu of an Eastern screech owl because of their size. They're mostly eating large bugs like crickets, grasshoppers, katydid cicadas, and then small rodents. And when you think about that, that really illustrates the importance of why we need to have our native raptors around is because of what they eat. I've described to you the diet of two and they both include bugs and rodents. Think about that. We have natural means of pest control against bugs and against rodents. Sometimes we have to pay people to take care of our bug problem or our rodent problem. Well, luckily we have wild animals, in this case wild raptors, that are taking care of that problem for us. Do we have any, Isabel, do we have any falcon questions or kestrel questions coming in? We do. Um, so Jack would like to know, what are the black, the black stripes below her eyes? That is an excellent question, and we'll make sure that everybody gets, gets a look at what Jack is talking about. You can see right underneath her eyes are black stripes of color. We call those malar stripes. Sometimes we call it a mustache, even though she's a girl kestrel, we still call it a mustache. That has a very specific function. So those of you at home right now, that play sports. Do you ever wipe black coloration on your face? And if you do, think about why you do that. I've asked groups of children this before, and they say, well, that's our war paint. That's to look tough. Well, OK, fair enough. But it actually has a function. What this black coloration does for the kestrel is it reflects light out of her eyes on those really bright, sunny days when she is trying to hunt. The same way that the black paint on your face reflects the light out of your eyes when you're trying to focus on catching a football or catching a baseball. So when we do those sorts of things, we are imitating what nature's been doing for a really long time. That's an excellent question and one I'm glad we got asked. Brian would like to know, is it true kestrels can hover? That is another excellent question. Kestrels are one of the only raptors that we have that can actually hover in place without the use of wind. So some birds can kind of cheat a little bit and, and get right into a headwind and they can do it that way, but kestrels are one of the only raptors we have that can actually hover still in place without the use of wind. What allows them to do that is their feathers are quite a bit stiffer than uh, some of the other raptors and that's what allows them to do that. So if you've ever been driving along and you look over and either right above the mowed median between the lanes of a highway or right over say a freshly mowed field, you see a bird that looks like this, it's this size, and it is just perfectly hovering in place looking down, I can almost guarantee that you are looking at an American kestrel. They use that to their advantage when they're hunting rodents from above and they're looking down and they're, they're looking for rodents or they're looking for those big bugs when they're doing that. Yes, very good. And then Elizabeth would like to know what can she do to help raptor populations in I'm Kentucky? glad we got asked this question because I was actually gonna throw it out to you all uh, if we didn't get asked. The question was, how can I help raptors? How can I help raptor populations in Kentucky? Maybe some of you are wondering what you can do uh, at home if you've got property that you can manage for raptors. One thing, to the two live examples I've shown you are both cavity nesters, so one thing that you can easily do is simply, if you've got some snags, if you've got some dead trees that don't need to come down, if they're not safety hazards, we'll leave those in place because those are gonna provide shelter and habitat for a lot of our cavity nesting um, raptors like screech owls and kestrels. If you can, if you've got areas that don't need to be mowed, they don't have to be mowed down into the, the height of like your yard would be mowed, you can let those grow up because that's also going to attract the prey items that a lot of our native raptors are eating. We have plans on our website. If you were to go to fw.ky.gov, we have plans where you could construct and build your very own 
Kestrel nest box if you felt like you had the habitat, but this is the key. You have to already have the habitat. You can't just expect to not have Kestrel habitat and put up a Kestrel box and the Kestrels will come. You need to have that suitable grassland habitat to begin with, but if you feel like you've got the habitat and if you've seen a few Kestrels on your property and you really want to help them out, you can go online and you can find plans to build and install your very own Kestrel nest box. So there are lots of ways that people can manage their property and be mindful of, of the ways that we can all help out our native raptors. Great question. Bobby would like to know, what is the most common raptor in Kentucky? What is the most common raptor in Kentucky? That's tricky to answer. I'm gonna give you my best educated guess. I would put the red-tailed hawk up there. Uh, the, we talked about how we do have hawks in Kentucky. We actually have a handful of species of hawks native to Kentucky. The red-tailed hawk is very, very common. It's one of the most common species of hawk that we have in all of North America. They're very adaptable. They, they can find a way to live and survive in a lot of different areas, whether that's way out in undeveloped areas or just right outside your neighborhood or right on the edge of town. They are very good at finding a way to make it work. So if I were to venture to you, my best guess on what one of, if not the most common species of raptor, I would probably put the red-tailed hawk up there. Yeah. Great question. That's all the questions for now. That's all the questions for now. All right, well, we, she is very relaxed right now. I was gonna maybe try to show you part of one of the ways that we have her trained but with live animals and live TV, sometimes you never know what you're gonna get. We can try this, we can try this and see if she's willing to, to do a little hop to my hand here. We can give this a shot. I have no guarantees, but we can try it for you because I told you that she can't fly well enough to survive anymore, but she can still fly. So let's see, let's try this. Let's just see if she's willing to do this for me. We'll start with a short one here. We'll give her a second to adjust. You ready? Flip. There we go. There's some more of that chatter noise. Now, by the way, you see this? She sees it, obviously. What I'm feeding her, the basis of her training, and the training involves, part of her training is just to sit here nice and calmly like she's been doing an excellent job of on my hand. And she was even preening and rousing for you all, which shows that she's totally relaxed. We have to understand though, she's a wild raptor, which means I can never fully train out her innate fear of humans because to a little raptor like this, I am a gigantic predator. So it takes a lot of time and training to get her to be comfortable just hanging out here on my hand. The way that we achieve that is with food reward like you just saw. And I'm gonna give her another piece here. See if you can tell which, um, by the way, these are her favorite food. We talked about what kestrels do eat. These are cut up pieces of mouse. We need to feed her the same exact thing that she would be eating out in the wild in order for her to be healthy. And, and uh, so that's exactly what we do here. You're probably gonna be able to tell which part of the mouse this was. So here, look closely. Anybody see that? <laughs> see that it doesn't really matter to her whether it's the head end or the tail end. It all, it all tastes the same and she needs every bit of it in order to be healthy. Now, one thing I cannot train her to have is good table manners. So. As you see, she's probably gonna to try to swallow this all, and oh, there it goes. See, I cannot really train her to have table manners, but uh, I can train her to do some other neat things. <laughs> any other questions pouring in? Do we have any other questions? Let's see. Eli, age eight, would like to know, why would an eagle eat a dead deer? Oh, Eli, that's an excellent question. Some raptors, not all, but some raptors that we have in Kentucky, including red-tailed hawks and bald eagles especially, they will, especially during times of difficult hunting, like in the winter time, they will eat dead animals. We call it carrion. Carrion is the meat of a dead animal. And they do this because their bodies are built to, to be able to handle it. Their digestive system can handle that sort of thing. And so say they've been hunting all day and they weren't successful at catching any food, but there's a dead deer laying in the field over there. Well, the dead deer is probably gonna be pretty easy to catch. So some raptors are designed to be able to eat meat from dead animals. And that's why they do that because it's easy. It's a very easy opportunity for a meal. Next question, Gabe, age 10, would like to know, how long can owls live? How long can owls live? Well, that really just kind of depends on the species of owl. So in terms of the types of owls we have in Kentucky, I said that we had four, but I'm not sure I actually listed them out. Those will be the Eastern Screech Owl that we took a look at, the barn owl, the barred owl, and the great horned owl. 
All but the barn owl are very common in Kentucky, and most of those can live 12 plus years. The great horned owls, uh, like red-tailed hawks, can live 15 to 20 years typically in the wild. They can live quite a bit longer in captivity because all of our raptors are, are so well taken care of, they don't have any natural predators to worry about anymore, and they get fed every day no matter what. So the, so the captive life expectancy for most raptors is quite a bit longer than the wild uh, life expectancy. But, Barn owls, however, the ones that are not so common in Kentucky, they don't live that long. They live four to six years in the wild, which also happens to be the average wildlife expectancy for kestrels, four to five years. This kestrel, she's seven years old this year. If she were a wild kestrel, that would be very, very old. But for a captive kestrel, who again has access to vet care if she needed it, uh, doesn't have to worry about predators anymore and gets fed every day no matter what, we can expect her to live 12 to 15 years in captivity. Brittany would like to know, do any raptor species migrate? Do any raptor species migrate? Another great question. So migration and asking whether or not a bird migrates and trying to have it answered in a yes or no question, it's kind of tricky to do and it really depends on where we are in the country. We in Kentucky are in a part of the country where a lot of our raptors, if they don't have to migrate, then they're not going to because migration is very dangerous. A lot of raptors and a lot of other bird species, songbirds, for example, they die during migration because it's a very long journey and there's a lot of dangers along the way. So while a lot of raptor species do, a lot of the northern populations are the ones that are migrating. So the American kestrel, for example, northern Northern populations of kestrels do migrate, but the, the populations that we have in Kentucky and bald eagles and red-tailed hawks and lots of the other raptors we have in Kentucky for that matter, they probably are not migrating much at all, if at all, but northern species do migrate. Yes. Heather would like to know, how old is a bald eagle when their head feathers turn white? Uh, very good question. So most people, do you want to pick up that? Uh, yes. Isabella, you want to show? Most people, if I were to ask you, imagine a bald eagle in your mind. The picture is going to look very similar to what you see right there. It's going to be a large raptor that's mostly dark brown to black in color, and it's going to have a bright white head, a bright white tail, and a really yellow beak. But most people don't realize that bald eagles don't take on that appearance until they're five years old. So during the first four years of their life, they don't have a solid white head, they don't have a solid white tail, and they don't have a yellow beak. Their beak is black and they have a lot of mottled coloration throughout. But when they turn five, and then so every year beyond five, they are gonna look like what most people imagine when they think about a bald eagle. Excellent question. I think we have a couple more questions. This is very good. We're having some excellent <laughs> questions. We appreciate all of you all at home giving us your questions. They've all been excellent questions. Drew would like to know how a raptor beak is different from a parrot beak. How is, it, okay, how is a raptor beak different than a parrot beak? So we took a look at the beak. Although parrots also have large, uh, sharp and curved beaks themselves, parrot beaks are designed to crack open a lot of nuts and seeds, the same way that a lot of songbird beaks are designed to do that. Whereas raptor beaks, as we discussed, are designed at, to act as their knife and fork and to tear off bite-sized chunks of meat. So although they look similar in appearance, they are different in function. They're used to do different things. Great question, though. Kristen would like to know, can owls fly silently? Can owls fly silently? Actually, yes, they can. So if you are hunting at night, things are going to mean more challenging for you. Even if you're an owl that's nocturnal and you are built to be hunting at night, you want to have every advantage. So owls have special uh, structures on the back edge of their feathers that collectively, their feathers together on their wing, allow those feathers to pass through the air, and this is the best, best visual I can give for you, pass through the air silently. Because if you have an object that's moving through the air, the air is actually made of particles. And the word turbulence means that you are disturbing the particles and you're creating a sound. When we have eagles, falcons, and hawks flying, when they're flapping their wings, you can hear that. You could actually hear that. But if an owl does it, because of those special features that they have, they can fly almost silently, which gives them a great advantage. If you're trying to sneak up on something at night and you don't want it to hear you coming, because if it does, it's probably going to try to get away from you. If you can fly almost silently, you're going to be much more efficient predator at night. And that's the exact case for owls. Absolutely. Eli, age six, would like to know, why is there a rope attached to her? Why is there a rope? Yes, this looks like a rope, so that's a good question. We can look at the equipment that she's wearing. 
basically when we have raptors in captivity, I need to have a way, especially once I take her outside in just a minute because she can still fly, I wouldn't want her to get scared or maybe to see a bug that she wanted to catch and just try to fly off my hand without me being able to keep her on my hand. These are called jesses. These are made of leather. And so I kind of pinch those between my fingers. And then this is a leash uh, that, uh, think of it the same way as if you had a dog or a cat. But instead of tying her to things and tethering her to things, really what the leash is for is just a little bit of extra security. If for some reason she was able to, if she got excited and saw something she wanted to catch and tried to fly off my hand really quickly, even if she pulled these out of my fingers, she wouldn't be able to get away because I would still have hold of that. So it's just a security measure. But this is the type of equipment that captive raptors do wear so that we can, we can kind of maintain control when we need to maintain control of them. Good observation. Jeff, Spencer, age 14, wants to know what is your favorite raptor? Spencer, what is my favorite raptor? I tell you, you are looking at one right now. Ever since I was a little kid, I have always loved American kestrels. And for another one to throw in there would be the red-tailed hawk. They're, it's not that these are rare birds by any means, but they're actually fairly common in Kentucky, but maybe that's why I like them uh, that much more because I've enjoyed seeing them my entire life. So if I were to narrow it down to two, and nothing against any of the other raptors. I love all raptors, really. But my top two favorites would be the American kestrel and the red-tailed hawk. We have so many great questions coming in. Ruby, age seven, wants to know, how do raptors get past their predators without getting caught? Okay, how do, how do raptors get past their predators without getting caught? It's a good question. The ability to fly is very helpful. Uh, they can get away from ground predators very easily if they're able to just simply evade them and fly away. But what do you do about your predators that can fly? So in the case of screech owls, or in the case of the American kestrel, during the daytime, she would have to worry about peregrine falcons, because peregrine falcons do catch and eat birds, and she would have to worry about cooper's hawks, which are larger and also bird-eating hawks that are very common that we have in Kentucky. The way that they would be able to do that would be to simply hope that they're able to maneuver and get away from them, maybe hide in a tree until things settle down, but with their speed is how they would be trying to get away from their predators. We probably, unless we have one last question. We have one last question. Perfect time. One last question. Journey, age six, wants to know how big are the kestrel nests? How big are kestrel nests? We, well, I told you that they're cavity nesters, but beyond that, they don't actually build a nest. They don't take sticks or grass like a lot of other birds do, like robins are doing right now. They don't actually do that. So once they find their cavity, the hollowed out part of a tree, they will literally just kind of arrange the bottom so that it's mostly flat and they'll just lay their eggs right there so they don't actually construct or build a nest. Thank you all so much for your great questions. We appreciate you all tuning in today for today's session on raptors. I hope that after watching this that you have a better understanding of what makes a raptor a raptor, how raptors are different than the other types of birds we have in Kentucky, and I hope that you've enjoyed getting an up-close look at two of the Slato Center's non-releasable raptors. We appreciate you tuning in today and uh, Keep your eyes peeled out there during your travels. If you pay attention and you know where to look, look in those likely places, those telephone poles, those power lines, those fence posts, you might just be surprised at how many raptors you can see with your family. So pay attention, and I bet you're going to start seeing more raptors during your travels. Thank you all, and have a great day.